Hi, I'm John Vorparian, and this is a special, no, it isn't a special sports edition. It's Beyond the Game, and we're going to be talking about baseball, hot stove, none other than the 1969 Mets. Great book is out called The Miracle Has Landed, and with me is none other than the editor and a good friend of the show, Matt Silverman, back to talk about, what else? The New York Mets of 69. I mean, <laughs> it's been, well, it is special. <laughs> it is special because it's been 40 years. It doesn't seem, uh, you know, it, it doesn't seem that, that long ago. Isn't that, isn't that something? And uh, what is different about this book about the 69 Mets than everything else that's currently out there? Well, the, um, because it came out 40 years after, we made sure that there was everything in there. So we have, uh, we put in, we, we did it with the Society of American Baseball Research. They've done some similar books on different teams, um, including the 67 Red Sox and the 68 Tigers. So the Mets are, are lined up right with, uh, with those teams. Um, and uh, we, we did biographies of every single player who was on the team. And we have mm -hmm. uh, Jesse Hudson who pitched two innings and never, never pitched again. Um, I was use him as a baseline, and then of course we've got Tom Seaver and Tug McGraw and Olin Ryan, and uh, because it, it's coming out at the end of the year, we were actually able to get some of the um, celebration stuff. We've got uh, some glossy pictures of the um, 1969 night, which was uh, I was lucky enough to be on the field for that, and that was uh, a really nice night that they had there, and uh, great seeing everybody out there, and uh, most of them still still in great shape. The, mm -hmm. One of the one of the interesting things about the '69 team is that they were so young. Yeah. When it happened, and their average age was like 25. That they're they're not, you know, uh, they're not as uh, as old as uh, you know some some players from teams uh, around uh, you know around then, or the you know, like the Orioles are several years older than the, than they were, and because of their their relative youth, I mean, some of those guys aren't even gray, <laughs> and still looking great, like uh, you know Wayne Garrett and uh, several of the other ones. Um, the '69 Mets indeed shocked the baseball world. Can you take us as to the setup of that fall classic between the Baltimore Orioles and the New York Mets? What was supposed to happen? Well, the Mets were supposed to lose, uh, you know, without any question. The Mets, people thought the Mets were going to lose to the Braves, uh, but it was the first championship series, so people were a little, they, they really didn't know what to expect from it, you know, from it. it, it uh, and the Mets blew through them, and people were like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, but they're like, the Braves must not be that good, but the Orioles will crush them because the Twins were actually had a pretty good team, and the Orioles just blew right through them in three games as well. Uh, and everybody expected the Mets to get slaughtered, um, but obviously it <laughs> obviously didn't happen. But, uh, you know, they figured the Orioles had, the Orioles had, you know, it wasn't just a, some kind of team that had a couple of things going for them. I mean, they had Hall of Fame pitchers. They had uh, Jim Palmer at the head of the rotation, but they also had Dave McNally and Mike Cuellar, who uh, were actually slotted ahead of him in, the, in, in uh, Palmer in the rotation. And they had a great bullpen for the time, and they had... Uh, uh, you know, Boog Powell was uh, was MVP uh, type caliber player every year, and I think he won the next year. And Brooks Robinson, Frank Robinson, Paul Blair, um, you know, was considered a great uh, great ball player of the time. And Mark Belanger, uh, you know, if you looked at his stats today, you'd say, you know, what is this? But for for his day, it was, you know, mm -hmm. still one of the best fielding shortstops ever. And he could hit just enough to make make the Orioles dangerous, and the Orioles pitchers could hit pretty well too. Uh, on paper, it still you know I, I spent two and a half years working on this. It still doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. but it still happened, and it's still a great story. You mentioned working on it two and a half uh, years, and you worked with forty other writers, so to speak, mm -hmm. to package this all together. And I guess, in the interest of full disclosure, you truly was one of the contributors to I it. Did too. Oh, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, next time I'm going to use verbs, please. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you focus, uh, the project actually focused on players, front office, and, and announcers. H who were some of the um, oral history? Did anyone uh, utilize oral history to a great deal in the particular chapters that are here in The Miracle Has Landed? Yeah, there were there were some people that, uh, that, re that really uh, got into it. Unfortunately, a, a few of the... Um, better known uh, players have uh, had had passed uh, passed on, including uh, Tug McGraw, one of the ones that, that I handled. But there, but there's definitely some oral history tradition, and that's part of uh, the thing that Saber has has done. One of the reasons that they've done uh, several of these books 
um, is to kind of get some of the players talking and um, you know see see what comes out of it, it is kind of funny that sometimes the the facts and the memories uh, clash a little bit but um, you know it, it, the stories are really what what make uh, something like this and uh, all of them you know all of them are at least a couple pages long uh, and and we also threw in a bunch of other um, tidbits on uh, all the the come from the uh, not just coming from behind wins, but what we call now walk-off wins. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't call them that then, but they had a lot of them, and uh, that really uh, built a lot of uh, confidence with the team. And, uh, um, you know, uh, Gil Hodges uh, got as much in there about him as we can. I and mean, unfortunately, he's, his passing is, uh, is nearing 40 years mm -hmm. as well. Um, but this is his, uh, his legacy, this team, and... Uh, um, and it's really just still a major part of the Mets all, all these years past. There will never be another team like that. Uh, you've written several books on the Mets, uh, Mets by the Numbers. You, you have uh, the website Met Silverman, I believe. MetSilverman.com. Uh, and, and also you contribute. To, uh, you're involved with, well, hold this up, this is another uh, ballpark, uh, baseball book that you've been involved in. So. Uh, just going back to the miracle is landed. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, what was a surprising factoid that you learned about the Mets that, given your uh, connection to bleeding blue and orange, wow, you didn't know about before? Well, there was one uh, that, that I I had the went through the Mets uh, yearbook uh, many times, but I actually looked at the um, schedule that the way that they printed it before the season. And I found out, and, and actually, a lady waiting in line with, uh, at the drugstore. We were somehow. I, I had bought this 1969 book from Time Life, and she was talking about 1969. She said, "Oh my gosh! One thing I remember: I got married that summer, and it rained, and it rained, and it rained." And I, I, um, I, I looked at that, and it, the Mets had tons of rainouts that year, which isn't that big of a deal uh, normally, except back then they played a lot of double headers. They had double, several double headers in the schedule to begin with. Uh, so early in the year, they didn't have any days off, and when they did have days off, they went up and played Army, and they, 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 had, they played the minor league teams, and they had rain wash a lot of those out, so they actually got some time to, you know, to rest up, and a lot of these players are young, they, they didn't know any difference, and then at the end of the year, when they were as hot as could be, and the Cubs were really cooling off, and they were, you know, Cubs were going this way, and they were going that way, they had all these double headers, a lot of them against not so great teams. One of one of them was kind of funny. Was the doubleheader that was caused because of that rain up at Woodstock? Um, you know that the famous uh, you know everyone running around in the in the mud and everything. But that rained out the Mets game. They had a doubleheader the next game next day. And at the time they were nine and a half back, and um, they swept that doubleheader. They swept the Banner Day doubleheader the next day, and it really pushed them on their way. And they just uh, just rolled through everybody. Thirty-eight and eleven finish. Wow. Uh, some of the heroes of uh, 69, uh, Jerry Grody, Al Weiss, the trading for players, I'm, I'm surprised, as I can recall, that they traded to get Don Clendenin. Uh, could you talk a little bit about trading for players on the, uh, in that season? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, several of the trades happened, uh, and, I, and John knows this because he did the Johnny Murphy, the general manager's uh, biography, but um, uh, they made a bunch of trades years before for kind of what you would call minor players, and those guys, they got them when they were young, Jerry Grody uh, among them. They got Wayne Garrett, who was uh, just barely 21, uh, from the Braves in the Rule 5 draft, and but they didn't have they hadn't made any major trades before in the season before they tried to get Joe Torre, uh, who at the time was um, he still was yet to win an MVP and he had switched from was sw in the process of switching from catcher to first base, and um, he he ended up uh, not coming to the Mets. The Cardinals got him instead, and the Mets still really wanted a um, a slugging first.